You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. It consists of a series of presentations by experts in allergy immunology and can serve as the didactic curriculum for trainees in the field. I hope you enjoy COLA. Well, we're at 10.02. If you don't mind, I'll just do a quick introduction, and then we'll get started here. Okay. Right, so good, good morning, everybody. It is August 15th, um, Monday, and this is Conferences Online and Allergy coming to you from Kansas City, Missouri. Um, today, our first speaker will be Dr. David Golden. Dr. Golden's an associate professor at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. He's been involved in many of our allergy practice parameters. Um, you'll know him most likely from the insect, um, stinging insect um, parameters. And he's given many a talks to us here. Uh, today, a little change in venue. He's gonna talk to us about anaphylaxis. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much. Uh, I will hopefully be able to, um... oops, did that work? Are you seeing it, my screen? It, we do see the screen, yes. Okay, now let's see if I can get it into presentation mode. Ah, I think that's Perfect. working. Yeah. And, okay, great, off we go. Um, anaphylaxis. I'm, I'm going to um, really talk around the subject uh, in a number of ways that uh, it's not uh, just a talk about anaphylaxis. It's trying to uh, review some of the uh, newer uh, observations and publications in the literature, um, many of which have figured into our updated uh, practice parameters and guidelines. Uh, the practice parameters, as noted on the bottom, I'll encourage you to uh, take a look at allergyparameters.org, the official website of the Joint Task Force on Practice Parameters for the Academy and College. Uh, there you can find all of the published uh, practice parameters that you can download and information about the projects that we're currently working on and planning and those that are involved. Um, there is an anaphylaxis practice parameter from 2015, which is still uh, a very important document. In 2020, I'll be showing you uh, what how we did a uh, update, a uh, very focused update uh, in a grade format, which I'll talk about. And we're currently working on another update of a uh, more broad so-called traditional practice parameter uh, but again we're going to focus on specific questions as as i'll show you uh disclosures as noted uh, i can uh, I, I can uh, well this is recorded i guess but i can always send you uh, copies of the slides as well um overview uh it, it seems funny perhaps to focus on like what is anaphylaxis but uh as of 2022 that is still an important question <clears throat> and much of the uh, publications and uh, an entire section of our upcoming uh, practice parameter update is devoted to this question and some of the points uh, listed here, which I'll go over, as well as uh, the other items listed here uh, is an outline of what we will look at today, starting with, OK, what is anaphylaxis? Definition of anaphylaxis. Uh, well, you know, you can say it's a multi-system uh, uh, allergic reaction, uh, which would be true. Uh, and that's generally the way we think of it. If you look at these definitions, uh, starting with the classic uh, so-called SAMHSA and N uh, or NIAID uh, Food Allergy Network definition um, from the publication in 20, 2006, that has really been the standard ever since. It's the me meaning that it's used uh, both in uh, clinic and maybe more importantly in research, uh, so that we can have a standardized. Um, approach to the definition of what's being reported. Uh, our practice parameters uh, and the WAO and other organizations have had other slightly different uh, definitions. Uh, we won't talk today much about the Brighton Collaborative. Uh, I did a talk on vaccine allergies uh, that focused a lot on that particular approach to uh, classification uh, and definition of vaccine reactions. But when you look at these definitions, what, what you're seeing is that they really are all kind of the same. The only things that actually jump out at me as being a little different is in the in our own practice parameter, uh, 
uh, definition, which is the only one that actually uh, includes the uh, mechanism saying that these reactions result from uh, mast cell mediator release, uh, which is interesting that none of the other definitions specify that. Uh, the Brighton Collaborative is the only one that specifies multi-organ system involvement, uh, although that would really not be necessarily correct. So that's one of the many problems we are concerned about with the Brighton Collaborative, although I will say that the Brighton Collaborative is currently in the process of working on an update to their definition and classification of anaphylaxis to um, weed out some of the problems that arose in, in their system of including things that are not necessarily anaphylaxis. So that, that's a definition. What about criteria for the diagnosis of anaphylaxis? Well, again, the NIAID uh, Food Allergy Network definition from 2006 pr proposed these three criteria. Uh, and it either had to be uh, skin and respiratory or circulatory uh, or two or more systems. So in that case, if it was uh, hives and abdominal cramps and vomiting, that would classify as anaphylaxis even without respiratory or circulatory symptoms. And number three would be hypotension uh, alone. Uh, for example, someone gets stung by a bee and uh, five minutes later collapses in shock uh, with no hives. Uh, that's an interesting scenario that we'll talk about, but that's anaphylaxis, even though it's a single system. So that was the best they could do. And, and there are limitations in all of these definitions and criteria. Uh, it's it's been very elusive to and still is to come up with definitions or criteria that don't have some kind of um, fault in some way or some things that they just wouldn't include. In other words, uh, sensitivity and specificity of these criteria are never going to be perfect. <clears throat> the WAO proposed um, an, uh, what they consider an updated and improved uh, criteria, which is only two things and. Uh, what's different here is that it's still, number one is still skin and one of the following, but the following includes respiratory, circulatory, or GI, severe GI symptoms. So that really uh, combines number one and number two from NIAID. And number two here in, in WAO would be hypotension or bronchospasm or laryngeal involvement. So this is where even a single, a single system, even if it's airway, can still be anaphylactic in the right scenario, meaning after exposure to a likely or known or probable allergen, depending on the wording here. Uh, and what all of these miss, of course, is the first episode. So someone gets stung by a bee, goes into shock, no hives, uh, but has never had a previous reaction and is not known to be allergic to be honeybees. Well, that actually doesn't fit any of these criteria and would not uh, actually be called anaphylaxis according to these criteria. Uh, simply because of that lack of the known or probable allergen. Uh, actually, highly probable allows for the idea that you could say, well, it might be the patient's first reaction, but it's still highly probable that that bee sting was the allergen. Whereas in the NIAID, it has to be a known allergen, not just probable. Um, so those are some of the differences. But none of these address, and these are some of the things that have come up uh, over the past five to seven years now, is um, unique aspects of anaphylaxis in infants and toddlers. Uh, the um, esteemed Estelle Simons and Hugh Sampson published this in Jackie 2015 to bring attention to the fact that uh, infants express anaphylaxis in different ways, often with uh, vomiting and urticaria, but uh, the behavioral changes, an infant who suddenly just is not themselves after exposure to a possible allergen um, is going to be suspected. If there are hives and unexplainable uh, distress or crying, that's potentially anaphylaxis in an infant. Uh, so a few years went by, but there was still uh, not much uh, in the literature to um, really drive this home. Uh, so an expert panel uh, headed by Matt Greenhot, who is one of the members of our task force, uh, and included uh, other experts, including Carlos Camargo, who I'll show you more about, and Estelle Simons again, and Phil Lieberman, who was the lead author of the 2015 uh, Practice Parameters on Anaphylaxis. So they um, pointed out these important facts about recognition, diagnosis, and management of infants with anaphylaxis. Uh, 
and, and the idea that you should consider giving epinephrine uh, when uh, the infant is showing the signs and symptoms listed here, which is pretty much what uh, a little more detail of what I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, both of these papers um, expand on these ideas in the text, of course, and are important reading. Uh, we will be elaborating on this as much as we can, uh, given the limited uh, information available um, in our upcoming practice parameter update. And again, it emphasizes the behavioral aspect in the bottom item. So other things about uh, definitions and criteria uh, relating to anaphylaxis, other terms. Uh, Tim Driven headed up a consensus group that published several really interesting papers about defining anaphylaxis, and in this case, about defining uh, patterns of anaphylaxis. So persistent anaphylaxis is when signs and symptoms persist for more than four hours. <clears throat> uh, anaphylaxis, uh, even without treatment, actually generally subsides within an hour or two. Um, so if it persists for more than four hours, it's persistent. Uh, refractory is when it persists following epinephrine and symptom-directed treatment and treatment with three or more doses of epinephrine or any IV epinephrine. Um, so th these characteristics would define refractory anaphylaxis. And biphasic must meet all four of these criteria. There must be new and or recurrent symptoms and signs that develop uh, after the complete resolution of the initial symptoms and signs and before the onset of new recurrent, uh, these new recurrent symptoms and signs. So anaphylaxis has to occur, get completely better, and then symptoms and signs have to reoccur without allergen re-exposure. And they must occur within a window in this definition of one to 48 hours after complete resolution of the initial symptoms and signs. Um, so at least an hour after complete resolution, um, potentially more than 48 hours, but that's really very rare. Uh, and always we'll bring up the question about whether there might have been a new exposure or unrelated cause. So maybe it's not really biphasic. So this is the def current definition uh, and is consistent with other definitions. Uh, this is a expert multidisciplinary Delphi study, meaning that this is expert opinion um, reached by consensus of experts. Uh, Driven et al. also published this severity grading system. Now, there have been many severity grading systems, uh, none of which are perfect, uh, many of which have significant faults. Um, Simon Brown in Australia published a, an excellent um, data-driven uh, severity grading system in 2004 in Jackie. And, and this is an interesting approach. And, and this is a summary card, if you will, that uh, some experts think should be posted in the ER or, or clinic. Um, and I'll say again that a lot of these definitions are of mo most use in research uh, or equally in research and in clinic. Um, because part of the problem in, in um, analyzing studies, and we, this is what we ran into in, in, in analyzing publications uh, in trying to prepare our evidence uh, basis for updated guidelines, is that uh, you have researchers who aren't using the same definitions and terminology. So what's mild or moderate or severe anaphylaxis? Well, as many papers as there are on the subject, I don't think any of them have the same definitions. Uh, which obviously makes it difficult or impossible to make any meaningful comparisons um, in different studies. Uh, this is a, a great table because it, it, it gives uh, succinct definitions and examples uh, of symptoms and signs that would qualify. And a quick look at this will show you that not only number three, four, and five are really what we would call anaphylaxis, because numbers one and two are uh, pretty much skin, mucosal, and GI. And again, it depends who's whose uh, definition you think of as far as the uh, NIH or WAO, as far as whether it's anaphylaxis, if it's just skin and GI. Uh, I forgot to mention, and I should mention, that uh, the WAO, we don't know yet if it's a better definition. Uh, the uh, Samson criteria have been um, validated in many studies over the intervening 15 years, um, but retrospectively and prospectively.
Uh, so we know a lot about the application of that, of those criteria and definition. Uh, the WAO criteria are very new. Have, and there are no published validation studies. So as much as we like the idea of the WAO criteria, uh, we haven't let go of the uh, NIH criteria and we're awaiting uh, studies that might serve to validate uh, the WAO criteria. These grading, this grading system is something that we hope will uh, be referred to and used by future investigators. So um, mediators of anaphylaxis. Uh, we, I think all would say histamine number one. We know that histamine is released. We can measure histamine, uh, although that's been difficult over the years. But there are now assays that uh, even though histamine is rapidly degraded uh, and difficult to stabilize, uh, you can measure um, blood histamine levels. Uh, but more commonly, we would measure methyl histamine in the urine. So the parentheses here are, are showing uh, what ideally we would measure and which metabolites we commonly measure uh, often in urine. So histamine, leukotrienes, prostaglandins, of course, tryptase we'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, I'll mention and show you a little bit about PAF uh, because we don't hear much about it, but its importance has, uh, I think, been very much underestimated and remains after many years to be fully investigated and validated. There are others that, you know, there are, there are pu good published data suggest that there may be a spe specific uh, role uh, and including a diagnostic role for carboxypeptidase or chymase in certain kinds of anaphylaxis, notably food reactions. Um, we really don't think about the fact that, uh, that um, cytokines are released in the course of anaphylaxis and may play a role. Uh, there are Australian data really pointing us to a neutrophil activation as an important pathway in anaphylaxis. And lest we forget, complement has long been known to play an important role in triggering anaphylaxis and mediating anaphylaxis as well. Um, tryptase is, uh, we'll come back to tryptase as a risk factor, baseline tryptase, but the tryptase that we can measure in the early stages of an anaphylactic reaction is currently the only real biomarker for anaphylaxis. A uh, patient presents with symptoms and signs that are uh, maybe not crystal clear, uh, or you want to confirm that it's anaphylaxis. Uh, we, we would now really suggest that every patient that presents with acute anaphylaxis should have blood drawn for tryptase. And you'll, uh, I think, agree after you hear a lot more about tryptase in, in this presentation. Um, but what, how do we know um, how much of an elevation constitutes uh, evidence of an anaphylactic reaction? Uh, Previous studies uh, and published reports and validated published reports have pointed to a formula of 1.2 plus 2. So, um, and that means you measure tryptase during the reaction. And then when the reaction is fully subsided, a couple of days or more later, you can measure the baseline serum tryptase and look at how much higher was the acute tryptase than the baseline tryptase. If it was 20% higher plus 2, then that would be accepted as evidence of um, elevated tryptase as a sign of an anaphylactic reaction. Um, less than that would be less convincing because there is some variability in tryptase levels. And one of the problems that's come up is that we, as we recognize more and more mast cell disorders, uh, including clonal mast cell diseases uh, like mastocytosis, hereditary alpha tryptosemia, uh, we've come to find that the 20% plus two rule, 1.2 plus two, um, may give a false positive, if you will. Uh, these patients, because they have constitutively elevated tryptase, they also have more variability in their tryptase level. So from one day to another, it could be 20% higher plus two, uh, even, with their, even in the absence of any actual reaction uh, at that time. Uh, this very recent paper, um, looked uh, especially at those kind of patients, uh, as well as acute anaphylaxis patients, and found that although the 20% plus two rule uh, had uh, equal sensitivity, meaning 100% sensitivity, uh, it had not as good specificity as a defined threshold ratio. And they looked at uh, several threshold ratios, but the ratio that gave the 
best combination of sensitivity and specificity was 1.685. Now, this obviously remains to be validated. Uh, they actually only looked at it in 22 patients with acute anaphylaxis, as well as their populations with HAT and mastocytosis. Um, but I think that's an interesting uh, proposal, and we'll be looking at this in the future. Is, you know, if the trip days during the reaction is 1.685 or more than times the baseline trip days, then that was an anaphylactic reaction. So just showing you um, how we use the acute trip days to help in confirming uh, and making the diagnosis of acute anaphylaxis. I mentioned PAF, platelet activating factor. Uh, Peter Vadis reported this, uh, it's hard to believe, but 14 years ago in the New England Journal. Um, and yet it's not something that you see mentioned much or used in, in practice. Part of the reason was that uh, it's very hard to measure this very unstable um, mediator. Uh, so there's no commercial assay available for PAF. But what he noted uh, and this slide is showing you not just the, uh, in that paper, he showed that the PAF level was significantly higher in patients with fatal or near fatal anaphylaxis than in other patients. Um, but he also showed that what it came down to was a deficiency of PAF acetylhydrolase. And PAF acetylhydrolase activity uh, or levels less than 20 are a risk factor for fatal anaphylaxis. So what you're seeing here on the left, let's see, my pointer may help, is that the fatal peanut anaphylaxis, they all had levels less than 20. And when you look at uh, adult controls, pediatric controls, a non-fatal peanut anaphylaxis, I mean, you'll, you'll see that there are a few less than 20. And, and in view of these data, we'd have to be concerned about whether these people are at greater than average risk of uh, fatal or near fatal anaphylaxis. Um, so this is something that ideally we'd like to measure in patients with potential or known anaphylaxis to see if they are at greater than usual risk of the most severe reactions. Turns out that PAF acetylhydrolase, as shown on the bottom here, is the same as lipoprotein-associated phospholipase A2, which is a cardiovascular risk factor and a test that can be ordered, So, uh, which I just discovered this year. So uh, again, this is something that may yet come into more clinical use in evaluating patients with uh, severe or potentially severe anaphylaxis. The, um, now we focused on mediators, but I, I wanna go back to the mast cells themselves and um, what triggers mast cells to release these mediators and cause anaphylaxis. So on the top of the slide, we're seeing receptors that are mainly immunoglobulin receptors, mainly IgE receptors, uh, for various um, antigens, uh, multivalent antigens, uh, immune complex antigens. And I won't focus on those. I'm going to look at the uh, lower part of the slide to point out that anaphylaxis um, goes way beyond just the classical IgE receptors on mast cells. Starting on the, on the right, we of course now know more and more and are learning more and more about uh, clonal mast cell disorders. Uh, mastocytosis uh, is uh, primarily a clonal mast cell disorders, although there are non-clonal equivalents. And th this is really a, a, a mutation of the uh, KIT receptor um, on mast cells in basophils, which uh, renders them uh, more active um, and therefore more sensitive to potential activation of anaphylaxis. A hereditary alpha-tryptosemia, HAT, has only been recognized in the past few years is present in about 6% of the population, but that could vary in different um, uh, ge geographical and cultural uh, populations. So it remains to be looked at, and we'll come back to why the HAT is looking more and more uh, important in our evaluation of our anaphylaxis patients. Uh, there are receptors uh, that are specific for other interesting things, for vibration, for cold. I mean, this goes to the of uh, physical urticarias, for example. Um, how do they activate mast cells? Well, there are actually receptors that respond to these physical factors, interestingly. Um, the, aside from the complement receptors on the left, C3A and C5A can uh, activate mast cells directly. Uh, 
but the uh, Merck PRX2 uh, receptor is also something that's getting more attention and as we understand its importance because it uh, is activated by a number of en uh, endogenous factors, including substance P, neurokinin A. So here is a potential pathway for uh, neuroimmunologic activation of mast cells. Uh, stress uh, is a risk factor for severe anaphylaxis, and this may be the mechanism. But it also is the receptor for exogenous agents, notably things like vancomycin, narcotics, quinolones. Uh, this, so those are not IgE-mediated reactions. They can occur through direct activation through this receptor. So all of these are things that we should keep in mind uh, when we think about anaphylaxis in the patients that we're seeing. The epidemiology uh, is uh, continuing to be um, evaluated and is changing over time. Uh, the Mayo Clinic has a captive population, if you will, in Olmsted County, uh, Rochester, Minnesota, and they published a previous paper to this showing the uh, incidence and prevalence of anaphylaxis in Olmsted County over a 10-year period. This is the follow-up paper for the uh, second 10-year period that showed that uh, during that time, there was a roughly 50% increase in the incidence of anaphylaxis in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, which is consistent with what we've seen in other countries as well. Uh, and this study from uh, Paul Turner um, in the UK, uh, we're seeing that hospitalization rates uh, went up considerably over this period of time, but fatality rates did not. So uh, hopefully we are pretty good at preventing fatal anaphylaxis. And as our emergency department colleagues to, to, will tell me whenever I um, whenever I complain about uh, something like they're not using epinephrine, which they have a bad habit of doing. Uh, their answer is, well, if the patient is alive when they walk in the door, they're not going to die on my watch with anaphylaxis. And uh, actually, I have to admit that's by and large true, uh, that they're very good at taking care of anaphylaxis, although they could probably do better if they would use epinephrine more. Um, so fatalities have not necessarily increased, but uh, the occurrence, uh, the incidence and uh, hospitalization rates for anaphylaxis have occur have increased. Uh, again, there are other data that from other countries that pretty much match that. Um, causes of anaphylaxis. This is uh, a very fluid slide. I've changed it a number of times over the years. Um, and, and really what, I, what I'd have to point out is that the, the, when, when studies look at the causes of anaphylaxis in a population, it obviously depends a lot on that population. If it's a pediatric population, food is going to be 60%. If it's an entirely adult hospitalized population, drug allergy is going to probably be number one. Um, so uh, take these percentages uh, with that in mind, that it, it depends a lot on the population being studied. But overall, food is uh, at least slightly in the lead as far as the uh, overall most common cause of anaphylaxis, but followed closely by insect stings, which is obviously seasonal. Uh, it is more than 20% of all cases in the summer, and it is a very, very small number of the cases in the winter, depending on which part of the country or world you're studying. Drugs and biologics, so we're seeing more reactions to biologics, so uh, this category has also been slightly increasing over the years. Allergen means primarily allergen immunotherapy reactions. Uh, exercise is a thing in its own. Um, some patients think it's rather amusing to be allergic to exercise, but I assure you the patients who have it don't think so. And the patients I see with exercise-induced anaphylaxis are often uh, the marathon runners and the highest level, most competitive athletes, because uh, the intensity and duration of the exercise play a role. And, and these are people who don't want to hear that the treatment recommendation for their condition is to lighten up, slow down, uh, not make their exercise as intense. Well, obviously, from the kind of patients I was just talking about, that's not an acceptable answer to them. So exercise-induced anaphylaxis remains a very difficult problem to manage uh, for our patients and for us. 
uh, when we see those patients. Um, and then idiopathic remains one of the most common causes of anaphylaxis. Uh, I've shown you here is 25%. So I'll show you in a moment why it may be higher in some studies. Uh, it has, may be lower in some studies. Uh, it has, according to some authors, uh, it is decreasing as we learn more about causes that we never realized before. Uh, on the other hand, um, with the increasing recognition of mast cell disorders, uh, some of these idiopathic cases can also be attributed to that underlying cause. But it, uh, those in clinic and in practice, I think, uh, might agree that oh, uh, if we've been doing it for long enough, I feel that I'm seeing more and more idiopathic anaphylaxis over the years, frankly. Um, and, and I think that's something that remains to be uh, more fully studied uh, and to see in which direction it is going. Uh, among the uh, you know, I, I, as I said, idiopathic anaphylaxis uh, may, of course, simply mean that we haven't figured out the cause, um, meaning maybe we haven't discovered certain causes yet. Uh, in my career, uh, latex allergy was discovered. Uh, uh, Alpha-gal allergy was discovered. Uh, some of the mast cell disorders uh, that we now recognize have been identified. So all of these would have been called idiopathic anaphylaxis in the past. I, I point out hidden food allergens simply because it's so easy to miss. And the only clue in a lot of these cases is the fact that they did eat prior to the onset of the anaphylaxis. Of course, we, uh, depending on your eating habits, you may eat one or two or 10 times a day. Point being that anaphylaxis almost always occurs within an hour or two of eating, it seems. So that's a, a tricky clue, but it may be the only clue to the fact that it could have been a food. Um, but then the patient will say, oh, well, I eat that all the time and I've never had a reaction before. Um, and there are potential reasons for that, including, and I don't know if I'm gonna mention this anywhere else. So maybe now's a good time to point out food dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis in which the patient is allergic to a food, let's say wheat, cause it's one of the most common but they don't react when they eat the wheat and they don't react if they eat exercise. But if they eat the wheat and then exercise within an hour or two, uh, sometimes longer, then they anaphylax. So uh, the test may be positive, but the patient will say, well, I eat that all the time with no problem. But um, sometimes we'll actually do a, a challenge, meaning eating the food and exercising to prove that it really was the cause. Many of these patients have had repeated episodes where a careful diary will reveal the cause. Uh, I'll point out two things on this list that are a couple of my favorites. The newest thing that I added to the list was the pea protein um, because it's become a rather common uh, addition uh, in ingredient to many foods that are uh, labeled as being high protein. Um, and many people are seeking out high protein foods for a variety of reasons. Maybe they don't want to have soy, which is one of the most common things used to supplement protein. Uh, so pea protein has become a common uh, supplemental protein ingredient. And of course, some people are allergic to it and can anaphylax. Um, milk protein and protein hydrolysate is, you'll see that on labels, but the FDA does not require that they label the source of the protein hydrolysate. And there have been cases of anaphylaxis due to a milk-derived protein hydrolysate. And then, of course, insect parts. Uh, if you haven't heard about pancake anaphylaxis, uh, <laughs> look it up. But it's um, uh, state fair season coming up. The Maryland State Fair starts next week. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, it's beach season. I say this because funnel cake there was a paper just in the past year, I think, on funnel cake anaphylaxis, which turned out to be the same as pancake anaphylaxis, meaning that the um, that the the mix the uh, the flour mix uh, has been sitting around long enough to become contaminated with dust mites. Dermatophagoides farinae, of course, farinae implies that they like wheat, which they do, flour. Um, so, in other words. Uh, if that box of pa pancake mix has been sitting in your pantry uh, through the summer with the humidity and all and the increased dust mites, then and then next winter you break it out uh, and make pancakes, 
Uh, you might not want to think about this, but there are people who will anaphylax to those pancakes if they are highly allergic to dust mites. Um, so, Phil Lieberman and and Jay Lieberman and their group uh, published this paper a few years ago uh, re regarding the changing uh, spectrum of anaphylaxis causes. Uh, you'll notice they had 35% of their 218 patients were idiopathic, higher than the estimate I showed you earlier. But their point was that in a previous publication of theirs years ago, they showed idiopathic to be almost 50% in their population. And it had gone down quite a bit because if you look at the list of probable causes here, alpha-gal is now one of the most common causes in their population because of the geography in Tennessee where they are is one of the endemic areas uh, for the tick bites and therefore alpha-gal sensitization. So uh, now that they can identify alpha-gal induced anaphylaxis, it turns out to be one of the most common causes in their geography. Uh, and before we Go, think too much about their 35 to 50 percent of cases of idiopathic anaphylaxis. Remember that they are a tertiary referral center for the most puzzling cases of anaphylaxis. Uh, so uh, I've encountered the same thing. Like I said earlier, I, I think I've seen an increase in cases of idiopathic, but I have to allow that that may simply be because I get a lot of referrals of puzzling cases of anaphylaxis. And uh, alpha-gal, to mention that for those who may not be familiar with it yet. Uh, Tom Platts Mills um, <laughs> is, is worth hearing whenever and wherever he speaks on any of a variety of subjects uh, because he is entertaining and he is a genius, uh, even if you don't totally agree with all of his ideas. But he is a fabulous observer. And going back uh, to the early 2000s, he made observations that are shown on this slide. Uh, cetuximab anaphylaxis in panel A. Uh, there were increasing reports. He was asked to investigate the reports uh, in Virginia, in Charlottesville, where he is. Uh, but this map shows that the cases and patients that he was identifying were pretty much from this area, which if you look at the adjacent panel C, is very similar to the area of highest frequency of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Uh, and in panel B, also Tom Plants Mills started to notice and believe reports from patients who said that the anaphylactic episodes they were having in the uh, during the night that woke them up from sleep were actually from the red meat they had eaten at dinner time. Delayed anaphylaxis to red meat. Now, anaphylaxis is supposed to be an immediate hypersensitivity reaction, right? So this review article uh, from Jackie 2015 is really worth a look. Uh, it, it's a fascinating review of the topic. Uh, but again, you'll see that this delayed anaphylaxis to red meat was occurring most frequently in that exact same distribution. Um, and finally, in panel D, that happens to be the distribution of the Lone Star Tick. And alpha-gal basically is people who get bitten by these ticks, get sensitized to a salivary protein that cross-reacts with galactose alpha-1,3 galactose, or alpha-gal which is present on mammalian meat proteins. So that person now eats uh, red meat um, and has anaphylaxis. Why it's delayed by many hours is still not 100% certain. Uh, the fact that it is not a protein, uh, the, the fact that it's, it's um, a glycoprotein, uh, uh, maybe part of the reason for this delayed uh, digestion and absorption and, and anaphylaxis. Uh, and in fact, the fat levels uh, in the food may play a role. Um, Alpha-gal is present in uh, mammalian meats. And uh, an example would be beef thyroglobulin is a derivative and, and has a, a substantial level of alpha-gal. Uh, Ray Mullins in Australia did this analysis. Cetuximab, I already pointed out, a uh, very high level of alpha-gal. And incidentally, when cetuximab was produced in a non-mammalian um, cell line, uh, or, or, or different cell line rather, that didn't incorporate the alpha-gal, uh, that cetuximab did not have the alpha-gal and could be safely used in these patients. But the commercial cetuximab uh, does have alpha-gal. Uh, so does uh, rituximab, in, uh, excuse me, um, infliximab. 
in some preparations also has alpha-gal incidentally. Um, so there may be other biologics that may contain some alpha-gal, but less than cetuximab. Dairy products, interesting. They could not detect any alpha-gal in skim milk or 1% milk, but there was detectable in heavy cream. So again, the fat level may, uh, you know, a fatty steak actually is more likely to cause anaphylaxis in these patients than a lean steak. Um, Beef-derived beef gelatin, so again, they don't have to tell you the source of the gelatin, but if it is beef gelatin, uh, it can contain alpha-gal, and there have been cases of reactions and positive skin tests to gelatin in uh, meat allergic individuals, in some meat allergic individuals. So much attention has been given um, in recent years to looking at risk factors and cofactors for severe anaphylaxis. Um, one of the first and most obvious is elevated baseline serum tryptase. This was a study of insect sting allergic patients and shows that there's a linear correlation here between the uh, tr baseline tryptase and the chance of severe anaphylactic reaction to a sting. Uh, the um, labeled threshold of normal or abnormal tryptase is 11.4. Uh, the mean in the population is about 4.5. And that's why we're seeing this line here. This is uh, the odds ratio is designated as one with a, uh, a tryptase level of 4.5. Um, but by the time you get to 11.4, the upper limit of normal, there's already a twofold increased chance of severe anaphylaxis. By the time you get to 20, which is officially still, maybe not forever, but still the threshold for investigating for mastocytosis, you at that point have a fourfold higher risk of severe anaphylaxis. Um, I'll point out that it's actually not linear. This later study showed this to be a bell-shaped curve. You'll notice there are only two or three patients here that have really high tryptases. And it turns out that patients with the highest mast cell burden and tryptases of 50 to 100 actually do not have this much higher odds ratio for severe anaphylaxis, which is a little puzzling, but it's been reported a couple of times. So uh, Margita Worm looked at um, in a uh, in the European Registry of Anaphylaxis. Uh, this is all kinds of anaphylaxis, risk factors for severe anaphylaxis. Well, age alone is a risk factor, uh, and that probably correlates with underlying cardiovascular disease, which is known to be a significant risk factor for fatal and near-fatal anaphylaxis. Um, mastocytosis, of course, I I've added in the odds ratios from this paper. Um, insect allergy, for some reason, uh, and it's interesting that certain allergens, like why is peanut so much more associated with severe anaphylaxis than certain other foods? Why are uh, insects uh, more so? We don't know. Uh, Tom Platts Mills has some interesting theories about these allergens. Um, but when we go beyond that, we're seeing uh, psychologic burden, otherwise known as stress, as being a significant risk factor for severe anaphylaxis. And there are a number of papers, I wish I had time to go into this because I'm fascinated by it, of uh, PTSD. Uh, PTSD occurs commonly in patients who have experienced severe anaphylaxis, but PTSD is a risk factor for severe anaphylaxis. People with known PTSD will have more severe anaphylaxis than people who don't. So uh, again, this is just all around this issue of stress and psychologic burden. Uh, beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, we will spend a little more time on, but they are associated with more severe uh, reactions. Uh, and finally, exercise, I will point out, uh, is a known risk factor. And we hear this all the time from our insect allergy patients. Uh, that, and of course, what do they do when they get stung while they're mowing the lawn? They run in the house. First of all, they're already overheated because they've been mowing the lawn. Then they run in the house and jump in a hot shower. Uh, I don't know why, but I hear that so often. And yet the exercise and heat are likely to simply accelerate the reaction or increase the severity of the reaction. Uh, interesting. Um, in the paper that I showed you about tryptase being a risk factor, they did look at other potential factors, and you'll see the top two items on this list are beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors with a uh, lower p-value, 0.002, than the beta blockers, interestingly. And yet, 
uh, Stovazant published, uh, and that these this group is also in Germany, just a couple hundred kilometers from uh, the from Ref, who published the previous paper. And yet, when you look at this study of severe sting anaphylaxis, uh, you'll see that the uh, factors associated with severity were uh, elevated trip days, absence of hives, interestingly, rapid onset, age. So where are the beta blockers and ACE inhibitors? At the bottom of the slide in the far right. So there was uh, no significance at all to these drugs in this study. And I still can't figure out, having carefully why the results were so different. But it points out that the literature is remains conflicted on this question. But there have been a, uh, a couple more recent studies that I'll show you. But first, I have to show you this uh, older study because it, it was really interesting the way it was done. This is looking at adults with known heart disease and a history of peanut-induced anaphylaxis. And it's a decision analysis. Uh, so the, the point here is which is more dangerous to stay on the beta blocker even though you're at risk for more severe anaphylaxis or to stop the beta blocker despite your risk of heart disease so and they looked at it in two models the post mi model and this, the chf model and they modeled it okay so what you're looking at is that yes the um, being on the beta blocker slightly increased the risk of moderate to severe anaphylaxis on the first line it increased by, an, uh, they project, they um, assigned a tenfold increased risk on the second line to anaphylaxis mortality in patients on beta blockers. Um, and, but the cardiac mortality was increased if they weren't on beta blockers on the third line. So when you uh, incorporate all of these assumptions uh, into a model of life expectancy, what you're seeing is that being on the beta blocker resulted in an increased life expectancy of 9 to 17 months compared to not being on the beta blocker. In other words, the underlying heart disease is a greater risk than the beta blocker. That's the simple upshot, and I'll show you supporting evidence from more recent studies. This is the only uh, systematic review and meta-analysis uh, just published, is the reference not on this slide? Or is it on the bottom there? I can't see it. Um, I'll have to make sure. The uh, So in 21 observational studies of 22,000 plus episodes of anaphylaxis, uh, to summarize their findings, they found that both beta blockers and ACE inhibitors were associated with increased severity of anaphylaxis, but not increased incidence. So it wasn't more likely to make anaphylaxis happen, but if it happened, it had a greater chance of being severe. They were not able to adjust for cardiovascular disease because of the close relationship of the cardiovascular disease and being on these on these medications. But they did note that the odds ratio for severe anaphylaxis was three times higher for the underlying cardiovascular disease than for the beta blockers and five times higher for the cardiovascular disease than for the ACE inhibitors. Going back to what I said about the underlying disease being more a greater risk than being on the medications. Sturm published this paper last year, which was both retrospective and for the first time prospective. Uh, so in 1,425 patients allergic to insect stings who were candidates for venom immunotherapy, he compared those who did and did not have ACE inhibitors or beta blockers and showed that the frequency of severe reactions to stings was not different. So being on these medications in this retrospective analysis did not lead to more severe reactions in these patients. And then he looked at the 1,342 patients who went ahead on venom immunotherapy and showed, first of all, uh, in the middle here, that being on ACE inhibitors and beta blockers did not lead to a higher frequency of uh, systemic reactions to treatment. And after a year on treatment, being on these drugs did not lead to a higher frequency of systemic reactions to stings. So uh, one important observation overall is that patients on maintenance immunotherapy are not at higher risk for, with these drugs, but patients prior to immunotherapy may have a higher chance of more severe reaction, even though this study actually didn't show it, but this previous systematic review and other studies did.
So on to our, and, and I better watch my time here, the uh, practice parameter update that we published in 2020 was a systematic review and grade, anal grade analysis focusing on very specific questions. So uh, you, you should learn and be familiar with uh, the grade system of analysis uh, and the importance because uh, many of our practice parameters are now and will be uh, grade parameters. Virtually every guideline coming out of the European uh, group is grade. Uh, and it has its strong points, certainly. We've published a couple of papers in Jackie in practice over the past couple of years to help orient you to uh, what grade is and how it's used and, and why it is of value. Uh, because even randomized controlled trials are not perfect. They can have inconsistency or bias or indirectness. And I, I won't go into a lot of detail for now. It would involve a whole other lecture, and uh, which I think we did uh, at the beginning of last year. It, it may be still available to view, uh, but hopefully we'll do another one coming up in the next year. Um, and aside from analyzing the evidence, great analysis when we're making recommendations takes into account uh, benefits and harms, acceptability, feasibility, equity, patient values and preferences. So that goes beyond evidence that when we make a recommendation, it has to be valid, um, including these all of these considerations. The strength of a recommendation uh, reflects uh, how confident we are uh, in the findings. Um, so and when you see a strong recommendation, this is just a table uh, and it's in our guidelines as well. We always put this information in the guidelines. What do these recommendations imply for patients, for clinicians, for policymakers? Um, and and I want, I'm pointing that out because some have thought that our conditional recommendations, uh, which usually means that, that there's a low certainty of evidence, that, that they take that to mean, oh, well, there's hardly any evidence. No, there may be tons of evidence but it may not be of the highest quality and therefore doesn't warrant a strong recommendation. And this is a difficult concept for a lot of people. We, we make recommendations and we think they're valid recommendations, but uh, in our specialty, there's often not uh, huge multi-center, uh, tens of thousands of patients controlled clinical trials. So we have to manage with the evidence we have. In, Great parameters ask specific questions uh, in a PICO format, population, um, intervention, comparator, and outcome, PICO. Uh, we asked what are the risk factors for biphasic anaphylaxis and should antihistamines or steroids be used to prevent anaphylaxis in these uh, four situations listed. Uh, so to show you what we mean by uh, evidence, so 32 studies uh, with up to 4,000 plus patients, depending on the outcome, were analyzed. And overall, the quality of the evidence was very low uh, because of some of these inherent biases. And, and one of the problems is that we can only report on outcomes that were evaluated in those studies. So circled here are some of the outcomes that just weren't uh, often reported, including, for example, um, how quickly they used their epinephrine. Uh, did they use it prior to the ED visit? It's just not even mentioned in many of the studies, even though it's a really important outcome. So what were our recommendations for biphasic anaphylaxis? Basically that uh, you should suspect a higher risk of biphasic anaphylaxis when the anaphylaxis is more severe and when and or when more than one dose of epinephrine has been administered. And the upshot of that in recommendation number two is that these same criteria uh, are used to justify extended clinical observation. Uh, and we looked at which patients should be kept, you know, patients should be observed for, uh, let's say, an hour after resolution of symptoms, but should they be kept longer because of the risk of biphasic anaphylaxis coming on later? Uh, well, actually, if the reaction was not really severe and did not require more than one dose of epinephrine, and I'll actually expand on this a little bit. These patients actually are very low risk for biphasic anaphylaxis. Um, example, uh, Ann Ellis, who is also on our guideline panel, uh, reported this uh, some years ago that in her study, 
uh, there was no biphasic response in patients who used, who had complete resolution in less than 30 minutes. Likewise, there were no episodes of biphasic anaphylaxis in 100 plus patients who used their epinephrine injector less than 20 minutes and had symptom resolution. When we take all this together, uh, many of us now feel that comfortable telling patients that if it's not severe and you use your epinephrine fast enough and you get better fast enough, you don't need to go to the emergency department. Now, that's a, a tricky statement to tell patients, but I'm telling you I've become comfortable with it. And because of COVID, uh, this came up early in, in, in COVID as to uh, should patients go to the emergency department, which uh, in that uh, at, at that time, we all know what the situation was in emergency departments. Uh, so Tom Casali and, and Julie Wang, who's in our group, um, published this paper uh, that basically comes down to what I just said. If you use your epinephrine promptly and you get better promptly and it wasn't too severe, you don't need to go to the emergency department. The question is now, uh, I hate to say post-COVID, but we'd like to think we're getting there. Uh, are we? Is this a, a guideline that we're ready to accept moving forward? And we're not there yet, but I've presented to you some of the thinking as to why this may be so. One of the keys here is early use of epinephrine, and we all know our patients are so reluctant to use it, uh, and they have every excuse in the book. I didn't have it with me. I didn't remember how to use it. I was afraid to use it. I thought I would just wait a little while and see if I get better, which, of course, is the worst thing to do. Um, so we, we all the more reason uh, from this discussion to emphasize to patients that they need to use it promptly. Um, I won't dwell on these other questions except to say that we couldn't find any evidence to support the use of steroids to prevent anaphylaxis of, of almost any kind. There were some interesting exceptions in our analysis, and again, it's limited by the available data. Uh, biphasic anaphylaxis, uh, no evidence basically uh, for corticosteroids or antihistamines, so don't use them. It's that simple. I mean, if you have a reason to want to treat itching with H1 antihistamines, okay, but don't fool the patient or yourself into thinking that this is going to do anything to prevent biphasic anaphylaxis. It won't. This is a view of what our evidence tables look like when we do this analysis. This is using uh, medications to prevent uh, the um, index reaction. So the first on the first infusion uh, uh, for chemotherapy, there actually is a place, you're seeing here an Oz ratio of 0 0.49, uh, and, and it's important that we show the relative and absolute effects. And again, uh, this is a, a subject to go into in a different lecture, but this is actually one situation where pretreatment is useful. What about medications to prevent radio contrast media reactions? No, no benefit at all in, in this analysis of, of uh, 15,000 plus patients. Um, and of course, this is on the use of non-ionic contrast media. The old data from the 70s and 80s uh, ha was that they, these drugs were effective, but that was for the ionic contrast media. What about allergen immunotherapy? And the answer is yes, actually. Odds ratio is 0 0.62 um, on the red square uh, box at the bottom. Um, and this was really looking mainly at rush immunotherapy uh, and Interestingly, not listed in, in this study, um, this Tom Casale study, but basically, yes, uh, uh, if you're doing rush immunotherapy, which we do a lot with insect uh, venom immunotherapy, for example, uh, pre-medication um, does help. So in a few minutes, well, I'm already over, but I'm going to urge you to read uh, the best review articles. There have been some excellent review articles in the anaphylaxis theme issues of Jackie in practice over the past couple of years. And there's, we're doing another one next year that will again focus on mast cell disorders. We have to remember that mast cell disorders, uh, every allergic reaction is a mast cell activation phenomenon. Uh, it's just of known cause. So those are the secondary ones. Uh, the idiopathic ones are the ones, or the primary, like mastocytosis, are the ones that we're focusing on. Uh, I won't look at the mast mastocytosis criteria for now. Mast cell activation syndrome is basically, you have to have the symptoms, you have to have increased levels of mediators, and you have to get better with treatment. If you don't satisfy all three criteria in the patient, they don't have 
definite mast cell activation syndrome. They may have possible or even probable, but we, uh, we're all seeing, I think, in clinic uh, that 95% of the patients who come to us for saying that they or their doctors suspect MCAS don't have MCAS. Um, so it's important that we recognize, but the problem is the symptoms. And again, this we could take a while going over this slide, but these are the actual known symptoms and signs caused by mast cell mediators. Notice anxiety, depression, abdominal cramps, uh, fatigue, headaches. So it's all there, right? Everybody's got mast cell activation syndrome according to those symptoms, and that's the problem. But anaphylaxis does occur in some of those patients. Um, and that usually makes it idiopathic anaphylaxis may be construed as a subset of mast cell activation syndrome, according to some authors, and I agree personally. Uh, this just shows that anaphylaxis, first of all, 40% roughly of patients with mastocytosis will have anaphylaxis at least once in their lives. Uh, so it's really common. Insect Anaphylaxis is the most common shown here. There are a lot of combination effects. I mentioned the food induced, food dependent exercises induced anaphylaxis earlier, but you see here a number of other combinations alcohol, uh, aspirin, exercise, heat. Um, there are a number of things, and, and stress isn't on this list, but maybe should be. Uh, HAT, I just want to point out that although it occurs in 6% of adults, it has been shown, and you can read some of these references uh, by Lyons Group, uh, 17, let's just say 10 to 20 percent of patients with sting anaphylaxis or mastocytosis or idiopathic anaphylaxis have HAT. And it's a biomarker for severity of anaphylaxis and can now be measured. Um, lastly, we're getting to where we really want to be able to prevent anaphylaxis? What about mastocytosis patients who are at great risk? What about HAT patients? What about MCA or idiopathic anaphylaxis patients, some of whom have it frequently? Or the I mentioned the exercise-induced anaphylaxis. How are we going to help these folks? Omalizumab is not approved for prevention of anaphylaxis, and yet there are over 100 re reports of success and some reports of failure. Um, there may be next generation uh, IgE receptor blockers that may do better. We shall see. Uh, but there are also efforts to look at blocking intracellular signaling pathways, notably BTK inhibitors. Uh, Remibrutinib is in clinical trials right now for chronic urticaria, for example, and avapritinib is approved for mastocytosis. But I'll just point out that al acalabrutinib uh, in these preliminary studies by Melanie Dispenza at NIH, uh, working with uh, Bruce Bachner, uh, who has been working on this for years, found that this, uh, in a mouse model, completely prevented moderate anaphylaxis, and in severe anaphylaxis, it protected against death. Wow, that sounds like something we want to have, and I'm just pointing out to you that we're getting closer to being able to help the people who are at greatest risk for the most severe reactions, uh, which we, as of now, can't really do. And this is the outline of the seven topics we will cover in our upcoming practice parameter update that we hope to have in press before the end of the year. Um, sorry I've gone over. I would take questions, but I think you need to move along, but you can tell me what to do next. Yeah, we'll, we'll go to one one quick question. If anybody has something, then we'll uh, move on with Dr. Pondier waiting uh, there. And, and incidentally, uh, I, I Welcome and encourage you to email me with questions about this presentation or anything you encounter or uh, any insect allergy or other anaphylaxis questions that you run across in clinic. I'm always happy to field questions and touch base if I can. So yes, go ahead. Any questions from the audience? All right, well, uh, David, thanks again for being part of this, uh, you know, the COLA program. We appreciate that and look forward to the, the newer updates coming down the road and having you back on with us again. My pleasure. Thanks very much. Have a great day. Okay. All right. Thank you. You too. Appreciate it.